Hello everyone, and welcome to part two on spine fractures. In part one, we discuss general features of fractures, as well as common fracture types. In part two, we will be discussing cervical spine fractures, as there are a few unique types. Going over basic cervical spine anatomy, we have C1, aka the atlas, shown here on the left. C2 is termed the axis and is shown above. The joint in between C1 and C2 is aptly named the atlantoaxial joint. C2 has a prominent anterior structure termed the odontoid process, commonly named the dens. It protrudes superiorly and rests just posterior to the anterior arch of the atlas as shown here. Of note, starting at C2, the cervical spine has a bifid spinous process protruding posteriorly, which is unique to the cervical spine. A typical cervical spine vertebrae is shown here on the right. Keep this anatomy in mind as we begin to discuss the different types of cervical spine fractures. Starting off with a Jefferson fracture, this fracture is unique to C1, the atlas. It is commonly caused by a hyperextension injury or an axial load injury such as diving headfirst into a shallow swimming pool. This results in a burst fracture of C1. A plain radiograph may infer a Jefferson fracture by evaluating the lateral masses for asymmetry, as shown here. However, CT remains the gold standard for bony evaluation, as well as for evaluating the rest of the cervical spine. If you are going to get a plain radiograph to evaluate for C1, C2 injury, then you should do an open mouth view, as shown here. The atlantodental interval is the distance between the dens here and the posterior portion of the anterior arch of C1. In this injury, C1 is disrupted and therefore the atlantodental interval increases as the dens remains in place and C1 is displaced. In this CT, we can see an atlantodental interval of almost 8 millimeters, which is well above the 2 millimeter cutoff for adults. Moving on to C2, we can have a fracture of the odontoid process, aka the dens. It is commonly due to hyperextension or hyperflexion, and it is the most common cervical spine fracture in the elderly population. It is relatively easy to see here if there is a large amount of displacement, as shown here. Hangman's fracture, which sounds judicial, is more commonly seen as a hyperextension injury, typically when following chin first. It is a bilateral pars interarticularis fracture of C2, i.e. spondylolysis of C2. Most importantly in this case, the dens remains intact. Surgery is an option if there is severe angulation or if there is disruption of the disc space. There are two types of teardrop fractures, flexion and extension. These are both considered compressive injuries. Flexion teardrop fractures more commonly occur in the lower cervical spine and typically disrupt the posterior longitudinal ligament, which runs along here, resulting in an unstable fracture. If there is significant bony retrolisthesis, then you should be concerned for cord injury. Radiographically, the antero-inferior vertebral body is avulsed, as shown here, with associated retrolisthesis concerning for canal stenosis or cord injury. The best follow-up imaging for that is MRI. Here we have its sister fracture, the extension teardrop fracture. This more commonly happens in the upper cervical spine as compared to flexion teardrop fractures which occur in the lower cervical spine. This type of fracture is more likely to be benign and while there is risk for anterior longitudinal ligament injury, it may still remain a stable fracture. It appears radiographically similar to flexion teardrop fracture, 
as it favors the antero inferior portion of the vertebral body. However, it typically does not involve, involve traumatic retrolisthesis or bony fragments. Lastly, we have the clay shoveler's fracture. As you can imagine, this may occur when trying to heave something heavy and having sudden muscular or ligamentous pull. This is a unique fracture as it describes a spinous process fracture of the lower cervical spine or upper thoracic spine, but it's typically around C6 or C7. Radiographically speaking, it appears as isolated spinous process fractures, potentially in two contiguous vertebrae, but usually no other types of fractures. It is often treated conservatively. Thank you all for watching.